I'm going to start by talking about this thing. It's, it's a Boeing 777 aircraft with two GE9115B jet engines. For the geeks amongst you, it's where I spent half of my life flying from London to Los Angeles. It stops off in Los Angeles on the way to Auckland. Um, this thing here, from its two jet engines on a return journey, creates about a terabyte of data, which keeps this thing in the sky, economical, safe, and gets us there in reasonably good time and very reliably. You're not allowed to look this up on the internet, but later on I'm just going to ask you, how many pages of A4 do you think a terabyte report is? A bit about me, uh, I specialize in high altitude medicine and physiology, so I spend half of my life doing silly things like this, and the other half in somewhat flatter climbs, like California, where essentially most of my work is in helping doctors make better decisions by, um, by using machine intelligence. It all began uh, with this guy. He's the guy that really got me into what information technology can do. Anyone know who he is? Douglas Adams, correct, who famously wrote what? I am glad to hear that we're in a cultured audience here. This is extremely good. So Douglas actually gave me my first job whilst I was still at medical school. Um, and it was, it was him that uh, r really helped me understand how medicine was going to change. I don't know if you remember, but there was a, in one of the books there was um, this species of hyper-intelligent beings who got so bored about life because they knew everything, they decided to build this thing called Deep Thought. It's a stupendously powerful supercomputer that they asked, uh, they set out to answer the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. And it spent 6.8 million years working out the answer and finally came out with the answer to life, the universe, and everything, which is correct, very cultured audience. Uh, obviously shows the difference between knowledge and wisdom. But, but what, what this illustrates is something that's happening in, at an incredible pace, and that is the power of computation. Um, everyone, everyone kind of knows where we're heading with this, but you know, many pundits are sort of looking towards the middle of this century at the point at which a $1,000 computer will probably outperform every single brain on the planet. And we can achieve some fairly interesting things with this in this fairly scary scenario. Uh, but it's also helped us very realistically do things like sequence the human genome in reasonable periods of time. I actually had my whole exome sequence, one of the first thousand people to do it commercially, for just $2,900 the other day. Um, it would have cost me well over a billion and taken 10 years um, not so long ago. Uh, but but s massive things are, are changing. What about healthcare? Well, that was pretty prehistoric 200 years ago when we just invented the speculum. 100 years later, and we were still sticking tuberculosis into turtles to try and find cures. Right now, just to show you what computers are doing, there's people like Dr. Marty Cohn, who I stole from IBM, that's why they don't like me, and, and what the Watson supercomputer that's able to outperform a bunch of cardiologists in diagnosing what's wrong with somebody and what best next to do. Um, but where will we be in a hundred years' time? To answer that question, we actually have to go back in time, past Hippocrates, to my favourite point in history. <laughs> Let's see if the audiovisual works. Darth Vader. An inspiration for me and a true example of the future of medical technology. Let me explain why. Darth Vader had 100% burns. Massive internal poly polytrauma. None of his organs worked. No arms and no legs. Some psychological stuff. some minor problems, and of course, and 
yet, Mr. Vader, with the assistance of lots of uh, devices and machine intelligence, was able to run the galaxy and enjoy life to the full. <laughs> but he, he wasn't my uh, real inspiration. It was, in fact, his line manager, Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> this is a true story. It's in the public domain, so no breach of patient confidentiality. But in 2008, Ian McDermott, who played the Emperor, um, he had a heart attack during the curtain call of Six Characters in Search of an Author on the opening night. And his agent called us up and said, Hey, Jack, you deal with lots of performance stuff and, you know, extreme conditions. Can't all those gizmos and gadgets you stick on people, can't you stop them from getting heart attacks or at least tell me when they're going to happen? And I thought, hmm, maybe that is possible. Um, yeah, so uh, I started thinking about that very problem. Uh, ooh, just as a quick aside, I, 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 this is a very important thing personally to me. I, I wrote a text message to me in one Christmas, and he wrote back saying, I hope your Jedi instincts are still intact, which is probably the most important thing anyone's ever said to me. Uh, <laughs> and it's when I became the Imperial physician. Um, but I, I don't actually work on the Death Star. I, I, I work at my institute in London uh, called the Centre for Health and Human Performance. And um, essentially what we do is we work with, ex with elite athletes, uh, but we also um, help apply the secret source of human performance science to help very sick people and ordinary people do extraordinary things. We do all the comic relief and sport relief challenges. I mean, remember Eddie Izzard doing his 43 marathons in 50 days. Uh, most recently, um, we, um, more recently, we had um, Dave Williams there swimming the channel. That's, uh, that, that's Greg, uh, Greg White, my co-founder. And uh, we also do crazy things, like I got thrown in a cage fight with Nick the Headhunter Chapman um, to see what would happen. This is actually true, um, I'm afraid to say. Um, <laughs> they, call, they call the match a draw. It doesn't really look like it, anyway. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and basically, we looked at the effect of rest, ice, compression, and elevation on the healing of my body. It was rather ridiculous, but um, it would do anything for TV. Um, so uh, we do a lot of science as well. We've upgraded our kits since then, and um, we produce an incredible amount of data. Um, an amazing amount of data, just like we do with elite athletes, but we do this on patients. And we can tell some pretty scary things about how your body ages and it can improve over time. We can tell pretty accurately by plotting the way in which your physiology is changing over time when you're going to die. <laughs> it's scary stuff. We do the same with jet engines, which comes back to my original question. How many pages of paper is this terabyte report? Any guesses? 100 pages, a bit more than that? Try 100 million. It takes, you know, it's a bit difficult to go through a 100 million page report in a ward round. But we do that all the time on every flight. This was the state of the art when I was born as, as far as data tracking. Height and weight every year as the trajectory to where my body was going. Let me ask you this next question. Would you get in an airplane that hadn't been checked for 50 years? The answer is no. But we do it in healthcare the whole time. The average length of time it takes from childhood to adulthood to start getting checked up is 50 years. That's why we fall out of the sky very unpredictably. So in 2012, I was lucky enough, uh, as Marx means the same thing, to go to Singularity University. I was on the Exponential Medicine program. That's me smiling in the top left corner. Um, and it was there. These are actually old pieces, old devices now. But I suddenly got inspired by the, the, these kind of new connected devices that were being developed. Um, no longer would maybe we have to, you know, build labs like mine with really expensive equipment in order to measure some of this stuff. It was becoming small, battery-powered, connected, um, and, and quite extraordinary in terms of what you could measure from these things. And stuff has moved on so much in the last four years. And it gave me the idea of perhaps would it be possible for the people like people like Alan Shearer that we would you know, help tune and get better quicker and all those sorts of things, could we use these devices to actually help the millions and millions and millions of people that are suffering from complex chronic disease and help them stay out of hospital and lead healthier, happier lives at home? So um, what we did, as an example, this is actually one of the comic relief challenges, is we, is we got Alan Shearer and Robbie Savage to sit on every seat in Wembley Stadium to try and tell which one was going to get round first. And we put a prototype biosensor on both of them, a tiny little sticky plaster, he stuck on their chest, and remarkably, this thing, which would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars only 10 years ago, is able to measure heart rate, your breathing, your stress, your steps, your movement, even a live ECG 
beam from your phone all the way to America and back again, and you're live looking at this kind of stuff. It's absolutely extraordinary. And would we be able to use some of this stuff and actually apply this to lots of people? Well, first, we have to make sense of the data. All well and good to have these amazing data streams, but we have to make sense of the data. So after Singularity University, I knocked up this prototype where we got tons of different sensors and stuck them into a fancy machine learning system. Um, we, we, enabled, we enabled doctors who didn't need computer science degrees to write the kinds of rules that go on in their heads when they, get stu when, when they want to uh, act early because of sort of subtle suspicion, like extra, extraordinarily subtle pattern recognition goes on in our heads, creating these, m these really complex state machines which kind of represent human thinking. And we knocked this up in about eight weeks, applied some machine learning to it, nothing new just application of well-known stuff um, and some, some neural networks and classifiers to help early identify the kinds of subtle patterns and signs that, 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 that doctors have when, when there's a team of them looking at you when you're in intensive care. Can we do that at home when you're not ill yet? And the answer is yes. And we created this company, uh, it's called Jointly Health, because it's kind of joining together what's going on at home uh, 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 as well as what's going on in the hospital. Uh, unfortunately, we had to change the name because we got too many calls for hip replacements and medical marijuana. <laughs> it's a Californian company, so, yeah. Jointly, man. Yeah. You do health, yeah? No. So we had to change it. Had to change it to Centrian, which means lookout, which is much more boring, but hey. Um, and uh, I mean, not to bore you with it too much, but it, it's winning tons of awards. Um, and uh, the fact is, is that the first tens of thousands of people in the world are actually now getting the same kind of level of care and attention from very, very cheap things that they stick on their bodies or wear around their wrists. And we're able to really accurately detect early, as if you, as if you had a team of people around you, um, when it is that you might be going to hospital so that we can act earlier and prevent you um, from uh, coming in. And there are five really important reasons why. And it's because of heart failure, it's because of things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, it's because of chronic lung disease or, or, or chronic asthma, um, diabetes with problems like renal failure and blindness, um, and, and when your immune system is compromised, mainly because of cancer. These five things are the five things that cost 73% of all health care. And most of it is because you come crashing into hospital unavoidably, uh, uh, um, but unpredictably. Um, so this little sticky plaster here, me peeling off Alan here, um, is literally about this big. And it's doing all of that wonder those wonderful things. This is not the only one we work with. There are dozens of these things. They, they, they're, they're beginning to cost less and less. Maybe £10,000 a few years ago. How much do you think that sticky plaster costs now? It lasts for five days. Five dollars. It's a dollar a day. This is amazing. You need the machine intelligence to help, but the data streams are there. Big question, and our goal, is for a dollar a day per person, can you solve a trillion dollar healthcare crisis? We think it's possible. And it's important that we do it in the UK. Professor Martin Elliott, a big hero of mine, first person to 3D print human lung, bathe it in stem cells, um, stick it inside this kid, Kieran, who survived, who otherwise would have died. His main point is not about doing fancy stuff, it's about addressing the biggest crisis our economies face. And that is that in the UK, we have to save 50 billion in less than five years. It's an undoable problem. Can we fix it? I believe we can. And I believe the key is in California. Why? Well, there are three key ingredients. California has a critical mass of geeks. Cle clever people who absolutely believe they can change the world. The second thing is a critical mass of greed. Investors, right from government down to, down to VCs, who, are, who believe in these people and want to make a lot of money. And the third thing is a critical mass of places that want to try out new stuff. And that is something that's very hard in the UK, is to find people that, you know, don't lose their jobs when they don't innovate. It's a key thing that we're missing. In the States, everyone's willing to try new stuff, because if they don't, they fall behind. But there's one secret ingredient, which I've been thinking about recently, since Mark invited me to come here. And that is not in California. This is why. 
On the left is this island, with its hospital in the middle. On the right is the same square footage of Earth in California, next to Los Angeles Airport, with its hospital, which has a 1.5 star rating on Yelp. <laughs> Note that Los Angeles Airport is about a fifth the size of this whole island. The key is islands, physical or non-physical. It, it is integrated, enclosed systems that can try out stuff that has an impact end-to-end, -end, right from the patient, the loved ones and caregivers, through to the GPs, through to the hospital, through to the social care system, through to the government budget, or even the private payer. It doesn't matter. But y islands can test things. It's impossible to test what's going on even in places like California, properly from end to end. And with this revolution that we are seeing in biosensors and machine learning, we need to be able to test, iterate and perfect things before we roll them out to the planet. Will that mean that we'll have a deep thought telling us what to do in Guernsey? Will it mean that people like me will end up pushing boxes around? I don't, I don't think so, but it will require a global effort between islands of intelligence creating the medical knowledge, the medical wisdom, and the communities that we need in order to cope with this growing crisis that we're seeing in complex chronic disease, and for us to work together with larger entities like the UK and then wider afield, uh, together with the people that are inventing the, the, the technologies, the devices, and doing the pioneering machine learning. Together, we have to use our skills in order to solve this trillion dollar problem. Just to summarize, do not underestimate the power of exponentially advancing technology. If you do, you will be left in the dark ages before you know it. The second point is do not underestimate the power of yourselves and this little island. There's an awful lot that you can contribute. And finally, do not underestimate the power of the dark side. <laughs> Thank you.